Hi, I'm John Mark Young, President and Chief Investment Officer of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers. And I'd like to welcome you to another installment of the Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers, What We Learned in the Markets This Week video. Remember, our aim is to provide you, our valued clients, with a brief video giving you information that's helpful to your understanding of the markets from a biblical worldview with no financial agenda, which makes us uniquely different from the news media in America. So let's talk about the four things we learned in the markets this week and the four things after we had a week off last week. Now, not a planned week off. It was a got the flu week off, but back at it again and stronger than ever. So point number one this week is after a great start to the year, fear has definitely crept back into the markets. The VIX, V-I-X, which is a measure of volatility within the stock market, that hit its highest level of the year last week, reaching 23. Now, generally, when this number gets under 20, it means investors are pretty complacent. Everything's fine. Nothing to normally worry about from the market's perspective. And when it rises above 30, it means investors are running for the hills. They're running for protection. As you can see from the chart on your screen, the VIX has held pretty dormant most of this year and only recently has it spiked these last few weeks. So what's the reason or rationale for this most recent spike in volatility? Well, uh, here I go again. I feel like Britney Spears. Oops, I'm going to do it again. The exact thing that shouldn't be driving it, except when you're in a high inflation environment, is driving it. And it was hot economic news. It was good economic news. In addition, you know, Friday uh, saw the markets take a quick dive uh, in the morning before the markets opened because the personal expenditures price index, which is the Fed's preferred gauge on inflation, that actually ticked up for the month. Now, the PCE is important because it is spending on goods and services by people, by you and I, by, by consumers, not businesses. So this goes by the two thirds rule, which is the economy is two thirds the employer or you and I spending money, which is a significant driver of GDP. Next week, we'll get information on the current state of home prices nationally, and we'll see earnings reports from Target and Salesforce. So we'll watch those to see how the market reacts. But let's now talk about what happened last week. And the S&P 500, which is our proxy for growth and growth and in income stocks, when taken together, was down 2.67% for the week, a third straight weekly decline for the S&P 500. The Russell 2000, which tracks our more aggressive growth and smaller companies, was down 2.91%. And finally, the MSCI EFA, which tracks international stocks in our Dave Ramsey vernacular, that was down 2.79% for the week. So to summarize this week, growth, growth and in income, aggressive growth, and international, they all were roughly down a similar amount. Now, point number two, Jamie Diamond is the CEO of JP Morgan Chase. Generally, when he speaks, I listen. When he has an earnings call for JP Morgan Chase, I listen to that. Someone that has the business acumen that he's achieved while having the benefit of data from America's largest bank, all the spending and receivables and payables and those sort of things from America's largest bank, that means he's well informed. Well, last week he was on CNBC for an interview where he was told, where he told Jim Cramer, the US economy right now is doing quite well. Consumers have a lot of money, they're spending it. Jobs are plentiful. In addition, he also was quoted as saying, that's today, but out in front of us, there's some scary stuff. You and I know there's always uncertainty. That is a normal thing. Well, ain't that the truth, Jamie, because we live in an imperfect world marred by sin and the fall from creation, which means the future is never going to be perfect. It's always going to be uncertain and scary a little bit. Uh, but this interview by him was interesting to me uh, because he made the famous saying he can see storm clouds on the horizon and Chase was prepping for that storm. So just a few short months later, strong economic data, improved consumer sentiment, and he's feeling pretty good. In addition, he's probably seeing data inside of J.P. Morgan Chase that you and I can't see that we don't know that provides a backdrop to this optimistic tone he's stating. Take a look at this chart. This chart shows the amount of consumer credit on personal balance sheets on the purple line. On the orange line, you'll see the amount of consumer assets on their balance sheet. The spread between those has widened in a good way. More assets, debt has increased, just not as much as the assets. Finally. While U.S. consumer debt service as a percentage of disposable income has risen, it's still in line with historical standards. When we look at this chart about two months ago, and I showed you this, it looked very similar. So this is something I would surmise that Mr. Diamond is looking at, something 
like this, along with job reports that are striking his optimistic tone. And point number three, there's a Fed research paper right now making its rounds. And it's from the Cleveland Federal Reserve, which is the one Federal Reserve that does a lot of work on inflation data. The last three sentences of the entire research paper summarize the whole point of the article, which I won't read to you because it's almost like reading ancient Greek text. It's very wordy and a lot of $10 words that are explaining $2 concepts. But essentially, here's what they're saying. The Fed has a target on inflation of 2%. We all know that. That's what they keep saying. 2% is what they want to get inflation down to. Why is it 2%? Probably because 1% is too low and 4% scares everybody, but nobody really knows why it's 2%. The Cleveland Fed is saying what it'll take in terms of economic pain to get down to 2% is going to cause so much economic devastation that in their models, reducing inflation down to 2.75 would not shift expectations for the future higher, but would not have as deep the economic recession costs and that their path is currently taking them on the, the Federal Reserve. The implied message to the Federal Open Market Committee is you should move your goal up to 2.75, not the 2%. And finally, point number four, let's get our first look at the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now model estimate for the growth of our economy in the first quarter of 2023. Now, let's remember this model uses an algorithm based on economic data that is being released in real time to estimate the amount of growth our economy is seeing in the current quarter, or of course the, the uh, decline that our economy would be seeing. Recall that the GDP numbers were 3.2% to the positive side for the third quarter of 2023, and 2.9% to the positive side for the fourth quarter of 2023. The current estimates for quarter one 2023 is 2.7, as you can see on your screen, and that is a lot higher than blue chip economist estimates, which are only expecting zero growth. In addition, as you can see from the trend line, that data has been creeping up, harkening back to what we talked about with JP Morgan Chase's CEO's comment. It's trending the right way because the data is coming out very hot. Of course, this number can be volatile as the quarter progresses, but as of right now, the model is telling us the US economy has only slowed slightly from the 2.9% we saw in the fourth quarter last year. This has been part of the problem with the markets these last three weeks. Solid economic data requires more rate increases, which puts us right back in to the whole problem we saw in 2022. So somebody please cue Marty McFly and get those references to Back to the Future going, but it feels like good economic data forces the Fed's hand to the upside and we got a replay, at least for now, of what we saw in 2022. Let's wait and see though. Again, you just never know. January, we saw the market increase 6% in a month and some of your more impressive funds were even better than that. So that's why you can't time this stuff because you were probably thinking that way back in January as well, too. So if you have any questions about the four things we learned in the markets this week and how it might impact your personal situation, please go to the comment section of this video where you can schedule a meeting with any of our financial coaches. Our financial coaches are the people that will help you get through baby steps one, two, and three. They'll help you get out of debt. They'll help you be on a budget. They'll help be your accountability partner. They'll help make sense of finances for you. And then our financial planners who help you work through baby steps four, five, six, and seven so that you can eventually live and give like no one else and become that everyday millionaire that Dave wrote about, talks about on the show every day, and that is so impressive and one of the greatest things about being an American in today's economy. Also, would you do us a favor? Would you hit the like button to this video? That helps us with Google and YouTube's algorithm, getting our content out to more people. And would you subscribe to our channel so that any of the content that I create our chief uh, operations officer Amanda creates or any of the other advisors create on our team, you'll be notified first that it's been released. Thanks so much. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week.